So today's guest is Big Bad Bear Jew. Now, I did a podcast with him a few weeks ago, and he was great. He had a lot of really articulate points, he was very polite, just overall great guy. But because of the political nature of the discussion that we had, I felt myself kind of getting dragged into some some sensitive topics for me. And it's not sensitive, I mean it probably is sensitive because of my lifestyle experience and stuff, but there are just some topics where I feel like I, I'm a cog in a machine for some for some collective shadow. I feel like this this sort of culture war in particular has just taken my anger and directed it towards um, people who I don't agree with. And actually those people who I don't agree with are on both sides in this case, but I just feel myself getting sucked in in a way that I, I don't like to see. I don't like, I feel like it's not the best person I could be. And so um, initially I, I apologize for not publishing our podcast because once again he was great, he was, he was excellent, a really good guest, but uh, I don't regret it. And I think going forwards into the future, I will try to stay above politics whatever that means and the problem is that i haven't actually figured out what it means i think that is one of the issues but what i think i mean by that is that i will try to distance myself from the topic of the day that that is enraging everyone because oftentimes i don't think it's the most important topic to discuss and also because even if it is an important topic, I think the act of fighting against other people uh, is not the best way to, to help our society grow and prosper. I think even if I am correct, which I am because I'm correct about everything, um, I think arguing with the other side is not the way to convert people. Because if that truly were the way to convert people, we would all have agreed by now. I mean, if it was all about if, if politics was just about facts and statistics that I pull from the air and, and give to you, then we would pretty much all have a consensus, right? But it's, it's not really how that works, because I think a lot of us think of politics as something that is intellectual, but in truth it's something more emotional. Um, and oftentimes it's just taking our traumas and, and weaponizing them and pointing them towards the other side, including my trauma. I, I personally see some shit online that doesn't affect me in the slightest and then I get angry over it for like weeks and I think the the lesson really is here to uh, disengage and to um, try to try to be as, as kind as I can to the people around me and especially to the people I don't agree with and really try to, to relate to them as, as human beings and not as um, you know like the right calls people on the left NPCs. And maybe not everyone on the left, I shouldn't say that, it's kind of generally miscategorizing, but people who kind of uh, echo a lot of talking points, they call them NPCs, and, and I think this is indicative of this dehumanizing thing uh, that we do on, on both sides for sure. I mean, if, if you call someone an NPC, they actually kind of get the humanity taken away from them, which um, I find myself doing, unfortunately, to people at times. Uh, and I think a lot of us do that. And I think the best thing we can do for um, our, our country, for, our, for the people we love, and, and to look past and look forward into the future of, of politics and social relations is um, to humanize people as much as possible, to, to look at that person who's shouting and talking about things that we don't agree with and, and really say like, oh, this person has a family and they, they truly want the best. Even if they're wrong, they want the best. And maybe they even have something to teach me. Maybe if they're not quite, even if they're not quite right about the statistics, maybe they actually are correct in some way um, that I can listen to. And one more thing is like, we need to be looking about where the culture war is going. Like, I mean, we, we talk about having a culture war, but actually like, what does that mean? What are the what are the final implications of this? Is is the end goal of the culture war to just become a real war? Is that what we want? I mean, do do we think that the other side is just going to coalesce and, and join our side? Like, actually, what what is the end goal here, and what are we working towards by fighting each other so much? So anyway, uh, 
This was a conversation with Big Bad Bear Jew, and it was much less political than it was before. It's uh, mostly about, I mean, we, we ended up talking about like traditional families, and um, which is a really fun topic for me, because I, I definitely try to um, inhabit a more traditional relationship, and that's just my own personal preference. Like, it doesn't need to be anyone else's, but um, I think we were talking about something that I, I feel is somewhat underrepresentative uh, in, in the community. I feel like I don't personally see a lot of like kind of traditional women talking about um, how to uh, how to be in a relationship that they might want to be in and, and um, how to find a traditional relationship and what the advantages are and what the disadvantages are. So uh, anyway, I, I found this really fun and I hope you do too. Have a good day. Big Bad Bear Jew, how are you? What's up? Doing good. Glad to be here. Yeah, good, good. Uh, so last time I talked to you, I it was this is totally on my end, and I guess I owe you an apology, kind of, because uh, we got into politics, and then I realized that I have this like this this kind of devilish need to to get so into politics and and become this like bipartisan, this angry bipartisan. It's just like mm -hmm. this this angry part of me that gets out and um, yeah. is quite addicted so, to it. And I I don't know. I didn't like it. Sometimes so I, sometimes sometimes when you talk about politics, you feel dirty afterwards. And so yeah. I definitely get that. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. I think um, I think I'm trying to grasp something that's slightly outside of my reach right now, and it's something along the lines of um, maybe I could be above politics in a way and. Um, I think even if, even if I, if, even if I think something is correct, um, I think that maybe arguing intellectual points is not quite the, the right way to go. Because if we were just arguing intellectual points, we would have figured it out by now. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't seem like that's, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think, I think, well, I think it's, at the heart of, of many political debates are our power struggles. And so it's not necessarily about arriving to the truth. Right, it's arriving at, at points that might help your political party or help other parts of your ideology. And so when you end up talking about one thing in particular, um, and you're really ignoring politics and get to the, the heart of things. But if you start relating um, everything you're talking about to politics, then it becomes kind of a, 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 a trickier route, right? Um, we were saying before this podcast started that um, there's certain issues that both political parties are, are failing at. Um, and really, I mean, certain topics that aren't really being discussed enough. And uh, it feels like all the things that are being talked about in our politics aren't really important concepts anyway. Um, I feel like a lot of younger generation, especially when it comes to dating, kind of feel this way, that they're living in a society um, uh, that uh, is kind of geared towards an older system of how marriage and dating and all that used to work. You know, you see that when it comes to uh, divorce courts, you see when it comes to a marriage penalty, right? It's usually a marriage benefit um, uh, when it comes to your taxes. Uh, in the past, when you had only one income earner, but now you have uh, two income earners, and so there's marriage penalty, right? So now younger people are realizing that, okay, well, now we're stuck in this older system, and those things should probably be addressed. We're not really addressing those things at all. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting point. What is the marriage penalty? I didn't know that existed. Yeah, so basically how our tax system works, um, and this is uh, slightly mediated by the fact that you can um, uh, file um, married, but... Uh, uh, so there's married jointly and there's a married filing individually. Mm -hmm. um, but but how it works is that in the past, if you were, let's say, you know, the male would be the income earner and the, and the female wouldn't. And so as a male, if you become married to a, a female and you're supporting her, right, which, is, which was the case previously, then um, the tax brackets get pushed up for you, right? And so if you want to pay, if you're paying 20% pay, paying tax, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but let's say 20% tax above 60,000 income, now it's 20% tax above 90,000 income, right? And so you end up paying less taxes because you're married, right? Mm -hmm. So that'll be the, the marriage benefit that was written into our code, which I agree with because I want to incentivize marriage. And I think that that makes sense. If you're if you're supporting someone else, your spouse, then you should be taxed less, have more disposable income. But now when you have two married people, then there actually is a slight negative you get because now you're getting pushed into those higher brackets anyway. And the higher brackets aren't like, they're not exactly double, Right, like if you're getting taxed at 60, uh, 60,000, 20%, and then move to 120,000, then there wouldn't really be much of a penalty. But it's not that, it's not that, uh, it's not that large of a jump. 
And so if you're getting taxed at a lower rate than double, then both of you, double income would be taxed at a higher rate. Sorry mm -hmm. if I made that more confusing. <laughs> I wish I had a chart to, to write no, down the numbers sense. here. But yeah, so you end up getting penalized where before it was written to, to benefit us. And it's so weird because this, you know, we rewrite our tax laws all the time. And that's not something that's ever discussed or fixed because we're kind of based on this old system. Again, it's an old system I agree with, um, but it doesn't suit our current society at all. Why do you think marriage should be incentivized? Because right now we have most of Western civilization, but I'm talking about the U.S., um, we're having our native-born citizens who are, who are uh, having an extremely slow growth rate. Um, I think, uh, I mean, blacks and whites are both, um, I think, are slightly above replacement. I think slightly. I mean, some of us, I haven't looked at these numbers in a while. Hispanics are higher. But because of this, we end up having to import a lot of people into our country. And that's the argument anyways. We need to import people to fill those, those smaller labor jobs. Because our society is structured so that older social security is, is structured so that older people are end up getting benefits so we need a big young base to bear pay for those benefits that older people are getting so if we don't have enough young people we need to import them in is, is the idea behind that and so because we don't have a um we're not really reproducing enough we can't build that that younger base um mm -hmm. also i think that i think that marriage and, and children a big family is an inherent good in society that we should be um, aspiring to, and I think that we should incentivize good behaviors. We're as a society, we're we're good at incentivizing bad behaviors, right? Um, we're we're good at saying, um, you know, uh, like, okay, you're on welfare, but you if you get um, if if you get uh, married to the to the so if you're if you have a, ch a child and the government's paying you benefits for having a child, you get married to the child's father, you lose those benefits, right? So that's incentivizing. That's disincentivizing good behavior. Hmm. Right. We're also, we also, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. We also like um, a soda tax. I think New York has a soda tax, right? So that would be, soda is a bad thing. I think it is, but you know, this is like talking about the issue. And so we disincentivize that, that way by taxing it. Right. And so if we're going to incentivize things, we should incentivize good things. And I think that marriage is inherently a good thing. Marriage and uh, the family creation. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, there's points that come up to me immediately, which is like, we are, I mean, whether or not you believe in global warming or, I mean, I don't know, I, I think uh, we are running out of coal, right? And renewables aren't going to get here fast enough. It seems like on the current trajectory we're at, uh, the models seem to show that we're not going to, our renewables kind of suck right now. Like solar doesn't really work as well as we kind of have this, we have this idolized dream of solar just taking over the country, but it just, it's not going to work, right? Yeah. And batteries aren't good enough. And at the rate that we're going through coal, we have like 40, 50 years left. And so mm -hmm. why, why is it a good idea to have a big family, especially for Westerners? So, um, so you're, you're referring to the fact that we might run out of energy. I don't yeah. really think that that's going to be the case. I mean, you know, um, if you're gonna, if you can make the the argument that um, you know uh, more carbon emissions. I'm just, I don't necessarily agree with it, but you can make that argument that bigger families would have that. Um, in terms of coal, I don't know specifics. Um, there's other forms of energy we have, uh, natural gas, right? Um, and uh, like, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to uh, incentivize people towards those new technologies, they are they subsidize a lot of green energy, right? And so that, that, I mean, if the premise is that those, those renewables are a good thing, then you should incentivize their usage. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't know why no one talks about nuclear energy. I'm not gonna talk about it because I'm not an expert, but everyone always says, oh, it's nuclear energy and it never gets talked about. Mm. Anyways, um, so when it, comes to, when it comes to your question about incentivizing good fam uh, big families, that would be predicated on the fact that, on the belief that we think the earth can't ho handle any more people. Um, I, I take more of a view, which I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, um, but also like, um, you know, the rest of the world is populating at extreme rates. Mm. And um, if, if we look at just, if we look at just for ourselves, then it makes sense to, as a benefit to us, for sure. You could say it has externalities, like us having more kids has externalities on the rest of the planet. That is, I mean, you could, you can say that. Um, but in terms of benefiting us and in, in our country, I, I think it definitely would. Again, we're importing people in anyway to fill in the kind of the, the, the younger working class. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one, but honestly, like, and this is something I tell my smart friends a lot. Like, IQ is largely genetic, and so if you have a high IQ, your kid is likely to have 
I don't know, apparently it's like the average of you and your spouse, right? Um, and if IQ is largely genetic, then smart people should have kids because uh, they are more likely to produce the next Elon Musk or whoever you want to sub, you know, sub into that. It's like uh, your kid could potentially solve climate change and, and have a net good impact on the world, um, which yeah. I, I think is well, it's kind of sad because I, I know a lot of friends of mine who are super smart, like doctors, lawyers, and they, they have this kind of environmental agenda and they don't want to have kids because of that. Uh, so we're kind of entering into an idiocracy, I feel like. I was about to mention idiocracy. I mean, that's the, I mean, that is the premise, right? But but it's a true premise is that the more, I mean, if we if we conflate IQ with education, which is not exactly the same, but the higher education, the, the, the less likely you are to have kids, or I should say the, the smaller your family size as a being on average, right? And then people like people with high school education generally have larger, more kids than people with, with PhDs, mm. right? And so, I mean, that's that that is definitely happening. Um, I think that when we start talking about this, though, the the problem is it ends up being kind of a eugenic argument at the end of the day. Um, not that I'm necessarily that individual thing is a bad thing, but I don't think we could ever implement kind of policies that ever um, kind of uh, incentivize that. Um, like, how do we? I don't think we can have a policy that would uh, in any way that would incentivize smarter people to have more kids. Um, but I, I understand your point, though, is that. Um, if we keep on going the way we're going, which we, we provide a safety net to people, so you don't really have to worry about um, necessarily taking care of your kids to full capacity, uh, then you get as many kids as you want. Meanwhile, people who are who are more intelligent, again, that word is, you know, kind of controversial and stuff, what does it actually mean? But if we're talking about educated, um, that yeah, they're, number one, they're afraid of, like you said, of like overexpanding and, and hurting the planet, but also a lot of them are career driven. It's like, oh, I put off kids, especially women, I'll put off kids until I'm 35. Well, if you put off kids until you're 35, then you can't have five kids. I mean, yeah. you could, but it's, you, really, you really can't. Um, so, so, but if you start having kids at 20, it's really easy to have five kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of different factors built up to it. Um, I think one of the things that is hurting people the most is, uh, hurting society the most is, is telling uh, young women that their careers are the almost important thing. For men, it ends up, being that way in practical terms, and it has always been the way forever, but there's a new shift to telling women that's what's to bring you, make you happy, and that's what's gonna fulfill you. And I always hear the counter argument, it's like, oh no, you can go and be a stay-at-home mother if you want to, but those but stay-at-home mothers are ostracized in our society, mm -hmm. and we look down at them, um, and they're never promoted as a as a good thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a binary. You can, you could be obviously a middle ground, you can have a career and have children, um, but we're promoting this um, kind of like uh, Sheryl Sandberg idea that you could be a CEO and have children. Not really. You can have, you can give birth to children. Um, but I know a lot of uh, women in the professional world, doctors, lawyers, things like that, who have kids, and then they outsource the job of parenting, right? They they go to work when their kids a couple months old, and then their kid goes to daycare from nine to five. Well, in that, in that case, I mean, I'm, I know this is offensive to say, but you're not really being a sort of mother that you could be if half the day your your kid is with with a daycare. Mm. And so we're 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 kind of sometimes we're trying to tell women to to ship their kids to outsource mothering so they can focus on their career, which I think is one of the biggest problems in society. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I guess even in in just a less offensive way, it's like you could just present the question. Do you think that it's a good idea to put your 18 month old kid in daycare? Like at, at what point do they get, I mean, there are, there are some studies and stuff. I mean, there's studies pointing in every direction, but there's studies that show that they get like separation anxiety and stuff because a, an 18 month old kid is still a baby. Like they can barely talk. And so putting them in a place full of strangers. And by the way, it's not like, you know, apparently sending them to grandma's house is fine or, or like mostly fine because they know their grandparents, it's a stable figure. And then usually it's like one adult for like maybe one to three kids, right? It's not it's not like one adult for like 10 kids. And then the adults vary and they don't really know you all that well. And I, I mean, there's, there's so much difference there. And I mean, I, I just think like, you have to ask yourself, would, would this really be the same as being raised by family? And I, I think the answer is probably no. It, it's yeah, pretty simple. I, I think that you're right that research points a lot in different directions, but one baseline that I've seen is that when daycare, in bubble, you said 18 months, I know, you know professional mothers that have their kids in daycare six months, you know, way, way earlier than that, when it's still a baby, but you know, that's besides the point. 
Um, when you look at the, the studies for this, it seems like it's the case that daycare is not necessarily a negative for rich people because they send their kids to daycare when there's like, when the amount of adults per child, the, the ratio isn't that crazy. But average Americans, <laughs> they send their kids to daycare and there's 15 kids for every one adult and they're not getting individualized attention. The family part is definitely part of it. But then you said like, oh, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, the individualized attention is a different thing because as a baby, you like, you know, you need the nurturing and you need some sort of stimulation. You can't just be lying there, right? Um, all the time, and so nine to five. And so maybe for rich people, it's not that much of a negative. I still think it's negative, but, but you know. And then, um, and then for everyone else, it's a different story, which is kind of, which is kind of like the, uh, um, like one of the, the troubles of our society is that um, rich people impose policies that can kind of work for them, but not for the rest of the of the, the, the rest of the of, of us and, and mothers, right? Mm -hmm. And so I I I definitely think that um, like we do need to reevaluate like like what is like what what should be the goals when it comes to children, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of, a lot of mothers don't view it that way of viewing it like it is outsourcing motherhood. I never really hear that that said, but that that's what it is doing. And, and you know what, like, it'd be great if you even have, like you said, intergenerational families. I'm all about that, that if you go and you can't go to work and then, um, you know, the grandma takes care, perfectly fine. Mm. I mean, maybe not exactly the same, but, 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 but good enough. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, hmm. I do wonder, Okay, well, actually, maybe we'll get back to this. Uh, I was, I didn't, we didn't quite explain why divorce was such a problem pr before. Like, why, yeah, we kind of just glossed over that. But I, I think, I mean, personally, if I've read some studies and stuff, you know, it's all studies, it's all statistics, but like, it just seems like kids from divorced families don't do as well. I mean, they don't do as well in school, they're way more likely to commit crimes. Uh, the list goes on and on. And I, I think that we, we seem to do something like glorified divorce. And it's obviously divorce is, is necessary in a lot of circumstances. But like, I don't think we really see the impact that that has on the future generations. Yeah, there's, there's one issue when it comes to, um, and there's a lot of studies on this part when it comes to children born to single mothers versus married mothers. And we see a huge a disparate impact in that if you're a married mother, and again, married mothers can later on get divorced. And so divorced people are included in that category, right? But but married mothers, those kids end up with way higher education, less crime, less drug use, every every positive, every possible positive um, benefit from that, right? So that's definitely the case. Um, but I mean, even if you're getting divorced, um, it might end up still being better than not knowing, you know, you're parent most likely your father because usually in divorce you can stay with the mother uh, it's probably better than not knowing your father in the first place mm. um but yeah i mean uh, our divorce rate is getting crazy high um uh, this is for a couple issues number one is that we've completely um trivialized marriage um we we uh i mean <laughs> uh, when i feel guilty i watched a show called married at first sight have you seen it before <laughs> oh they, they just did an australian version of it actually i'm pretty sure um, it's, uh, it's one of those shows that I, I pretend to my wife that I hate, but uh, I'll watch it with you, but it's, it's amazing. <laughs> um, but the show is that they, they get married at first sight and let's see how it happens. And they always end up in divorce because number one, the producers put up bad couples together. That, that's besides the point. Our culture kind of trivializes it. Well, marriage is a very, very serious thing. I mean, if I was a dictator, I would say, uh, when people get married, like certain things should be criminalized, such as adultery. I can't imagine a bigger crime against another human being than being married and cheating on someone, mm. right? Like, what what is worse, your husband cheating on you, um, or you getting punched in the face? I think sure. your husband cheating on you, and potentially when you're married, is better. I'm sorry, is worse. Sorry, um, but that's not a crime. Um, but getting punched in the face is a big crime. Can't do that, right? And so um, I think you know, like, we need to take marriage more seriously in that aspect of things. Um, no thought divorce was was, was definitely um, uh, an, an issue with this, um, but uh, yeah. So when it comes to promoting marriage as as a societal good, that's what comes goes back to the tax policies. Like, okay, we need to show that this is a good thing we shall aspire to do mm. for sure. And and uh, again, uh, so, so going back to my second point about divorce is that, um, and I think we might have uh, talked about this a little bit last time, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that 
in the past, you're usually a virgin until marriage. Um, you know, monogamy is one of the, um, well, celibacy until marriage and monogamy are two of the building blocks of our society that we've had for centuries <clears throat> until the 1960s. And I mean, so I think I don't think we actually have though. I think I think people just were a little bit sneakier back then. Well, there's <laughs> stats that show that. Actually happened. I know the stats that uh, in Chicago, like a third of all men lost their virginity to prostitutes or something like that. You you hear things like that. Um, but at least that was the value, and it was definitely happening a lot more. Like like most of our grandparents were probably virgin until marriage, or at least a high percentage. But the percentage now is is much 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 lower. Um, and I'm not even saying necessarily like maybe uh, being a virgin until marriage is probably the best thing, but at least like limiting sexual partners is probably a good thing as well. Mm -hmm. Because when you have sex, you bond to another person. The more bonds you have, the harder those bonds uh, uh, become to create. And um, there's no way to show cause and effects here, but yeah. that's what I believe is the biggest cause behind the effects of, of a divorce is that people's bonds aren't as strong as they once were. Um, we could all remember. Um, or many people listening could remember the, the first person they had sex with, if it was like a boyfriend or girlfriend, and how you know crazily emotionally bonds you were to that person. And you might go, oh, well, I was a kid. Well, you might have been a kid, but I know people lost virginity at 30, they felt the same way. It's mm -hmm. because that's your first sexual experience. We were kind of made to bond to people through sex. And so the more you do it, the more you lose that bond. And then it becomes a rational, divorce becomes a rational decision after that. Divorce, uh, staying together, sometimes it's helpful to be irrational. Right. And to actually have the irrational bond, like I'm going to stick with them through th thick and thin, not like, oh, okay, our financial situation has changed. I'm not enjoying this anymore. I think I can do better. And then divorce because of that. Yeah. But what if you get married to someone and then you find out they have like a weird fetish? Like they're, they're into, they're into some fucked up. Like, what if you find out they're I into like, vomit or something i mean how would you deal I, with I that thought, i thought you're, I, I thought you're about to say something a little more serious than that like what if you <laughs> find out that they're like a, a serial killer or yeah, a yeah. Or like i that. guess that too because because that i'm like oh well in that case i'm not saying divorces should be made illegal like i'm just yeah. saying you got to have a good reason behind it i would say if they're into um uh throw up during sex that you, uh i'm not saying you gotta participate but i'm not saying that's i'm saying that's not a reason for divorce okay all right <laughs> work work around work around it somehow divorce <laughs> is, is too important but but I, but i know you say i mean a lot of people say like oh like what if you're not uh sexually compatible mm -hmm. it's like well you could work and become more sexually compatible and you can go and do a lot of things whether it comes to getting toys involved or talking through it like you can make sex better that's not a reason to to mm. not be with someone, right? I always say that argument like, oh, well, if you, um, if you like lose your virginity to the, um, to the first person you marry, then you're always going to wonder. Well, actually, you're always going to wonder regardless. And so that's kind of a bad excuse. Um, like when you have sex with people, it doesn't make you, um, less curious about the world, I don't think. Um, mm. if anything, it feeds an appetite that never is, never is going to be satisfied. Um, and so I don't really buy that argument at all. And, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a perspective, which I, I didn't do that before marriage. And also I'm not religious, which is usually what you hear that uh, comes from. I think this is just science at this point. Mm -hmm. We have enough evidence to show that we're, that human beings are, are, are good at pair bonding. And, um, we've been mostly monogamous for a very long time. Some societies have been polygamous. Um, that's kind of an outlier. At least the woman was, was monogamous in that case. Um, but even those polygamous societies, those were where you had extremely rich men. And if you didn't pair up with that rich man, then you'd starve to death because no other man could provide for you. Right. So mm -hmm. that was kind of like polygamy out of desperation. I think that monogamy is a, is a building block for society. And, and that's, um, that's bolstered by celibacy until, until marriage, or at least as close to that as possible. It's interesting. Cause I think, uh, polygamy back then was also like a social move. Like if you look at I think monogamy and polygamy and the way we pair bond has giant effects on the society that we live in. And so if you have polygamy, then you have a lot of men who have no women. And so young men who have no access to women generally are women kind of tone men down in a lot of different ways and, and keep them more sane and, and civilized. So men without women are going to go out and maybe wage war for instance, uh, yeah. and then go and take the other villages, women, and then just slowly conquer. Like, um, I don't mm. think it's a surprise that Islam in, in, uh, in the Middle East is so widespread, and it is also a, a polygamous religion. Yeah, and I don't even know if you're talking the theoretically, but we, we, I mean, we have a lot of studies on that. 
about how like polygamous cultures are a lot more prone to violence to revolution because right when you have a lot of men with idle hands who aren't married don't have a family what incentive do they have to keep on working every single day mm. right and so yeah they are much more likely to rebel and, and you can't create a stable society under polygamy mm. um but you can under monogamy and monogamy like i, I said before that we're we're suited to monogamy maybe not in like an evolutionary level I mean, um, women more so than men, but men are always, always going to aspire to have multiple women. And that's a bad thing for society because the reason we just discussed. And what I don't like now is that our society is promoting uh, free sexuality. And this does not benefit women. Um, the dating market right now is awful for both men and women. But women in particular are expected to be sexual very early on, especially if they want to you know, date someone kind of higher in the, the sexual marketplace or if you want to call it. And they're being pressured to, you know, send nudes all the time. And uh, if we're not having sex on the first date, then I don't have anything to do with you, right? And I think women understand this. There's obviously problems on, on both sides, but that is caused by this, you know, open sexuality movement, um, which was started very long time ago. It didn't start the sexual revolution. It started with Sigmund Freud, who said that the root of all evil is that the suppression of our, of our sexual nature. And so a lot of psychologists from Freud's time said, Hey, if you have sex a lot of, if you, if you go and just keep on having sex and you completely are not repressed, right? If you just let it all out, um, that's a secret to, there'll be no more wars, and there'll be <laughs> peace and love. And that was your theory. And it's completely not true, as we can see. And it doesn't make society better to do so. But that idea kind of caught hold in, in the mainstream. We don't really think that way anymore, but it inspired the sexual revolution, which did take hold throughout that, oh, should, you should do whatever you want. And sex is just love. And it's just... It's just fun. Well, that's just not the case. That's the most intimate thing you do with another human being. Of course, there's going to be emotional consequences of it. That's such a man thing to say, like, hey, women, if you want to get better, just have sex with me. <laughs> exactly. It's, wow. it's, it's, so, it's so weird that that trick even works. And that, <laughs> no. that like, like, we have men starting this movement mostly who are just like, it would be, it would be really great if, if women just are having sex with all the men around them. And then women were like, probably like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, oh, no, I'm a psychologist. I, I know. <laughs> like, that's like, I'm the authority figure here. And uh, yeah, like Freud got into some scandals of like, I think, don't call me this, like, like pushing sexual encounters on his patients. I know a lot of other um, psychologists from that time did yeah. because they saw they're out. Like every man is always looking for that little tricky move they can make. And if it's from a position of authority, then, you know, they're going to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I love, a lot of things that, that women have come to in the past 70 years is kind of astounding. Like that we said to women, Hey, I know it might be nice to, to keep a home and have a family and have one man, but what if you got cheated by a bunch of other men who were using you for sex and you had to work nine to five at a factory all the time? Wouldn't that be better? Right. It wasn't <laughs> posed like that, but that's what ended up happening. It's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, so Hmm. women have there's this idea that women and I, I agree with and I see it play out but um I think a lot of people might not agree with it because it's not like it's not equal or something but women tend to go up in the hierarchy so when they're looking for men generally you you find that you you're looking for a man who's like maybe smarter than you or more successful than you specifically more successful um but it's really whatever domain that you're really interested in, I think. So if you're like super athletic, then you you want a guy who's more athletic than you. Um, and, whatever the value may be, yeah. Yeah, whatever the value is. And uh, there's this interesting thing that's happened where in the past, so I would say this is an evolutionary construct where women are just trying to get the best man they can. And then in the past, it was fine because you you were a housewife no matter what i mean generally you might have done some little things here and there but you if you're your rich status, you might have been different yeah yeah if you were yeah you were rich you came from a rich family you would marry a rich guy or whatever but like now women have the ability to climb the social hierarchy and so while men have stayed relatively the same i mean they can also climb the social hierarchy now women can elevate themselves to high statuses in a way that they couldn't before so Whereas in the past, it used to be like, well, he has a job and I don't. And so he is higher status than me because I'm a homemaker and he has a job. Now it's like, well, his job isn't good enough because now I have a better job than him. And so we're, we're going through these interesting times. Uh, and actually, I would say that um, intelligent women are, are actually probably uh, 
quite affected by this because there's this interesting thing that happens where like uh, intelligent men can go for any woman. So if, if, if you if you hold on to this theory, like intelligent man goes for possibly multiple women, possibly many, or maybe just one, but she can be like a lot dumber than him and he'll probably still be happy in, in this theory. Whereas an intelligent woman only wants a more intelligent man. And if you're in the top 1%, now you're looking for the top 0.1% or something like that, like super high. And so you actually have less and less of the pick of the litter. A hundred percent. Man, the evolutionary strategy for man is to impregnate as many women as possible. For women is to find the best mate that could take care of their children and provide them with security. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, men are going to be looking, like, again, like, you know, it, it sounds um, inhumane to, to put people on like a scale of numbers. But but the real world does work that way. We know that some people are viewed as more attractive than others, and even if even if it's a little bit subjective. Hmm. And so, if someone, if a guy is an eight on this on this scale, then he'll go after fours and fives and sixes and sevens. But a woman that's an eight is not going to do that. She's going to go after nines and tens, hmm. right? So this has two problems. Number one is that it raises women's expectations because they go after a ten who just wants to sleep with them. But now they think that that's their dating pool. They think that that's who they could end up marrying, right? Whereas, whereas um, men, when they when they date down, they don't really do this in the same way. And so, I think the women are, are building this kind of like self esteem of what they are looking for. It actually ends up being a lot higher. Now, back to your point, is that um, if you're in, a, let's say you're an intelligent, attractive woman, and you want and you're, and you're dating, you're always dating up, right? Well, um, number one, it's hard to find a, a guy if you're more intelligent who's also intelligent more intelligent than you like the smarter you get the more chats you get there's just a smaller dating field um but also as as you as women are, are in dating like a lot of times you get women who are attractive successful all that and they'll get old you're looking for the right man and then they don't realize by the time they're 33 their actual options actually went down a lot because men select a lot on age and so women who want to become professionals first and they go okay i want to settle and afterwards it's like oh my 20s i dated all these hot, successful men, right? But now my field is even lower because of that. And so I think a lot of women end up, and I've, I've maybe you've seen, I've seen with so many of my female friends who, as they got older, they, you know, used to date more successful dress. After they got strange, like, okay, fuck it. I'm just gonna get married to the guy who's giving me some attention right now because this is just too frustrating, right? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna marry like the friend instead of like the one, you know, I might not be as attracted to him, but at least he, he's successful and secure and all that. And so I think women's expectations are getting higher. And since women are, are marrying later, then actually it actually really hurts them a lot because they're not as valuable in the sexual marketplace as they used to once be when they're getting those tens. Again, a lot of this subjective, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah, it's um, it's really tough. Uh, it's and you do constantly see. I think we we kind of have this problem where like guys who are really successful now are choosing just to be polyamorous i mean they're they're not going for getting you know in the past it was like oh you know you might sleep around a little bit in the past i, I assume but it's like you you would kind of get tied down and married pretty quickly and now it's like you actually have polyamory is kind of a multifaceted problem because the really successful guys are going to get a lot of women and then the women are kind of I think a lot of times emotionally tied. I mean, you, they say you can do polyamory without feelings. I don't, I don't know if you can always separate feelings from, some people can. And I think most people You can probably start to, especially if you, if you have a lot of sexual partners, maybe at that point. But, but yeah, I, I think that the issue, I, I just, uh, I just it, it puts an arrow in my heart when I hear the word polyamory. When guys are polyamorous, it's like, guys want to fuck around a lot. Like, I'm polyamorous, so I actually can't commit to you. It's complete BS acts. Um, I think that, I think we understand this, but I understand what you're saying. And that, yeah, like a, a lot of men would just choose to sleep with, with a lot of different women and women get strung along. Before I was married, I was in the same boat and I let a lot of women on. And a lot of women, they kind of went along with the show because they, I mean, it was slightly normal. Like that, that situation is not unheard of. Like I'm dating a guy and yeah, he sees other women, but it's not a big deal, whatever. And so that's a huge problem for women that women are kind of like just suckered into because they want to be with that high status, successful guy and all that. Um, and we're making it more, now, especially with the term polyamory, we're making it even easier because if, because if back, you know, five years ago, you know, 10 years ago is to say, 
well, he's a, a player, right? It's like, so it's a slightly negative connotation when it's like, don't get involved. He's like a player. He's not whatever. But now it's like, he's polyamorous. He's just, he's just too loving. And I've heard that from girls. Like, oh no, like he don't want to commit to me. He just, he just don't understand. Him. He's more of a guy who's like, he's so full of love that he just, he just can't love one person. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> do you, do you hear yourself right now? Like, I can imagine the guys like, oh my god, I can't believe that works, right? We're we're now like the like the, I think the feminist movement is like giving guys all these lines to use against them all the time, like polyamory. If you're listening, no guy is polyamorous. Um, I mean, I don't think any really woman is either. Um, yeah, we all have the capacity to love, uh, have multiple romantic partners, but I think that your love gets divided when that happens, and mm -hmm. even if it doesn't. And most practically speaking, it's never going to work for jealousy reasons. Um, it's never worked for other practical reasons, such as who you end up getting married to, who ends up buying the house together, right? Those things will, will break apart. I mean, I know we haven't had this the polyamory thing for a very long time, but I think, but that, hopefully, maybe I'm just maybe I'm just too hopeful. Hopefully, ten years from now, we're all going to laugh and go, "Yeah, that was kind of crazy what we're thinking about that." I, I'm probably wrong, but hopefully, it'll just be a phase. <laughs> hard to say. My uh, my partner used yeah. to be polyamorous right up until he met me, and then I was like, uh, "I'm Put not, on I'm not playing this game." <laughs> I was like, yeah. "I'm not doing this," and he was like, it's "All right," and uh, yeah. it just worked out. But uh, yeah, it's, I think it's polyamorous up until you see what you can get away with. It's like, okay, well, I want to be with that. I do want to be with this one girl, so I guess I got to jump everyone else. Yeah, I think that's it. And um, it, it's interesting because he told me about this this thing that happens where I said. Um, He's, I said, like, would you, like, would a polyamorous person be okay with, like, being right next to, like, right next door to a couple, you know, his girlfriend and then another guy having sex? And he was like, oh, yeah, this is a common topic that we talk about. And no, like, usually they want to be far away. They don't want to, like, be near it. And so it's, like, because of jealousy. And it's like, okay, so you do feel jealousy. You're just kind of stuffing it into a box. Like, you're like, oh, no, I, exactly. I, I want to I wanna stay away from it. And you're you're kind of just ignoring your feelings at that point. If exactly. you wouldn't be okay with with her going and fucking another guy in the next room, then what? You're not really okay with it. I, yeah, maybe polyamory is just people who are really really good at ignoring their feelings, right? <laughs> and it's like if you really separate it and put it into a box, right? Most of us can't do that completely. Maybe those people are just really really good at it. Because yeah, you're right. Like if it's if it's bad to happen right in front of you, it's also bad to happen in you know in the building next door right um just because you're not seeing it doesn't change the nature of acts right if you're feeling jealous for a reason because we're, we're animals and we you know we we view our sexual properties as uh, sexual partners as property in a sense i know people don't like to see that word um but that's how it works in the animal kingdom right it's like we view that as ours and no one else wants to, to have sex with them because they're mm -hmm. ours mm -hmm. and so like yeah if you if you if you ignore it then maybe that problem goes away temporarily mm -hmm. Well, when I when I first talked about this with him, I was like, I don't want to become polyamorous because I want your energy and, and resources to go directly to me. I don't want you to be divided. And I mean, it sounds selfish. It's like I want I'm I'm being selfish in the sense. But like, there's really no other way to right put now. it. Sorry. Yeah. No, in our culture, I guess it sounds selfish. But I mean, yeah. what's, what's selfish about wanting your romantic partner to be invested in you, right? Yeah. Um, it's like, I want to be like, like I want to be invested in you. You want to be invested in me. And let's commit to that. Let's yeah. not bring anyone else into the mix with their own thoughts and feelings about what a relationship could be. Because at the end of the day, if 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 you're polyamorous, um, if you're a polyamorous partner, then it's not your relationship. It's other people's relationships too, because they have some control over it at the end of the day. Mm. They have some emotional pull, right? And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, against the idea now. Um, but uh, I guess kudos to the guys that are pulling it off. <laughs> I'm really excited for like five way divorce courts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like Both. a bunch of parents. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how, like, you heard like, the whole entire thruple thing. That was a thing for a while. Didn't, yeah. didn't that, like, once they legalized thruples, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm misheard. I don't know. That sounds ridiculous. Not that I'm saying, I'm saying that. But I don't think it sounds like super crazy far off. It's, um, I mean, I guess that wouldn't make sense because I think, I think for some reason, polygamy is still illegal, um, yeah. which is weird because, because like we accept it in our society, we don't accept it in our laws. I mean, it's completely accepted to have multiple partners and, you know, to cohabitate before marriage and all these different things. But our law, I guess, is still kind of 
kind of a relic of the past. <laughs> I mean, it's, it changes every single day. It just, it just would be so, I, I assume it would be so legally difficult. Like it would be so much more difficult if you had three people that had to share in custody in like divorce and, and alimony and, and custody. Like it would just get more and more complicated in a way that I don't think we want. Yeah. And, and you mentioned custody. Like I also wonder what these people who are polyamorous or throuples, whatever you want to call it, what they think will happen once they grow up and kids get involved. Um, like could a kid, um, be raised by a father and two mothers yeah i'm, I'm sure that could happen um is it ideal probably not there's probably gonna be a lot of jealousy issues um and again if there's a divorce what happens the kid loses two mothers or you know like one how does that work you know mm. um it's, it's, yeah, it's so it's, like may, maybe it could work i mean like there has been like uh in, in america i really do think that the the best thing is that is, is a mother and a father um and um some people might hear that and say, what about two parents, two gay men, two gay women? That's fine, too. I still think it's probably ideal for mother and father. But there's been other sorts of um, uh, of upbringing across the world in which you had the whole entire community raising the child. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I don't think it works in our system. I would like to see a mother and father, or at least like we talked about before, like grandparents or family helping out. And yeah. not like, because they're the ones that have the best interest in the child. And I, I've said this to my my friends, a lesbian, and we've talked about having kids before. And I'm like, I, I've said this to her before too. Like, it's, I'm sure it's being a lesbian mother is fine, but like, you want a male involved regularly. You want you want the other gen, you want the kid to see what the i a good person of the other gender looks like, and you want you want them to be a role model. Like whether it's an uncle, whether it's a friend, whatever it is, because it's probably not good for it child it's probably less than ideal for a child to grow up without seeing uh having like a mother figure or just a, a just a strong female figure or a strong male figure in their lives i mean it's just human yeah. like we we need that yeah i mean my, my ultimate thing is you know my, my sister's uh my sister's gay she's married to a woman and um and she's she's a great mother my, my issue is this is that if there was a difference um so like we talked about before like how there's a difference between um single mothers raising a child and a married couple right if there is a difference between a gay couple raising a child and a straight couple raising a child that would never ever 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 come out in any study because colleges would never allow that to happen and so there has been studies on this and it's been overwhelmingly positive and it's like actually um the, the children of gay parents um will actually succeed in in, a, in, in more ways than, 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 than uh, children raised under straight parents mm -hmm. um if you look in those studies I and mean, the reason why is because gay people tend to have more money they tend to be a higher social class and so their kids would naturally do they don't control for social class the first thing you should do in a study my point is that if there is a difference i don't think that we'd ever even know that and so i'm not saying that there is one um i'm just saying that my concern is that in our society we we could never figure it out if there was mm -hmm. and again like the difference would be like what is it like, um, two parents definitely better than one, 100,000 percent, but what is it like when it's not both of the sexes at once providing different role models, like you said? I don't know. Um, at the end of the day, um, that's the issue that is like so not worth fighting at all because the issue comes to single motherhood. Like, again, when it comes to two parents, as long as it's two parents, I'm on board with that. My issue is like, you know, I think the, one of the biggest problems in society is, is single motherhood. Yeah. How it's, it's interesting, too. Have you ever read the book, The Body Keeps the Score? No. It's a good book. Uh, it's about, it's a doctor who, it's a nonfiction. It's a doctor who's realized that, like, a bunch of his traumatized patients, like, uh, or even obese patients, patients with schizophrenia, like, chronic fatigue, like, um, autoimmune diseases and stuff, a bunch of them have had, like, severe childhood trauma. So there's a, there's a huge correlation that he points out between childhood trauma and, like, also physical diseases, not only mental. Anyway, so he he said that there was a government in one of the, in Norway, one of the Scandinavian countries, they did a, a government program where they would take parents and just show them how, like mothers specifically, and like show them how to raise kids. Because a lot of times parents don't actually know how to raise kids, like especially if they had shitty parents themselves. Some parents yeah, he talked about would like play with the kid and then the kid would the baby would be like like do this they wouldn't want to play anymore they kind of shr like shrink their head away and then the mother would keep trying to play with them because she didn't understand body language and then so there was this government program 
where they came in and they were just like, hey, here's some basic shit about raising a kid. Here's some like really simple stuff. And then they it reduced crime later on by like sevenfold. Like it was just amazing. Like it, it just, it, it had huge consequences. And I think, a, but we don't, we don't see these kind of social programs. I would love social programs where it's like, oh, if you, if you pay a dollar, you get $7 back later and everyone is, more mature, better raised, less crime. It's it's just I don't know. Uh, I'm, we don't, don't seem to prioritize is, motherhood. Go on. Um, and I definitely think we should. My my issue with that, and I don't think we were saying is inherently a, a, a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it, it depends on the government that is uh, teaching you, right? Like I don't trust the American government right now to teach people how to raise their children. As a matter of fact, I would be extremely outraged if that were to happen in America. Extremely outraged. However, again, it, it depends on on the government because there are you know, like a lot of people are like very absolute about things like, ah, oh, government control and all that. Well, it depends what the government's like. Um, like some governments are better than others in their policies. And so, so it, it might be able to work. I don't know really anything about Norway. It's in Norway, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. I, I mean, maybe, maybe it, it could work there. I'd be, I mean, also Americans would never go for that because we're extremely pro freedom and, and fuck government. <laughs> um, well, I mean, maybe the past year, we, <laughs> we haven't missed so much. Um, but um, I, I don't I don't really think it would work. Um, but I, I, I agree with you, like, these values are supposed to come from the grandmother and the, and the grandfather, like, you teach your kids, you raise your kids in a certain way that they know how to become parents, right? But if you both are working all the time, you know, a lot of people, like, they go, they go to school, they love kids, they go to school, and then they go to after school program and they come home at seven and they go to sleep at 11. They're there for a couple of hours. And those couple of hours are not like, okay, kids, let me teach you about life. They're like, let's just watch TV. I'm tired the whole entire day working. Right. And so we have lost so much, so much family time with the system we have now. And if we don't really learn those values that you should. And so, yeah, you might be right that if our society keeps breaking down to a point where, um, where we're not just many of these ideas, it'd be great for, a good authority to come and teach his ideas. I don't trust the U.S. government to do that. But, but my point is that hypothetically, I, I, I think I like your idea, just not in the practical terms here. Yeah, it would be, it would be nice if we could guarantee. I mean, it, you could, I guess, film them or something. But if you could just guarantee that they're like going, maybe it's voluntary first of all, and maybe secondly, they they're just not going to like throw any political bullshit like they're not going to throw any political shit in there it's just like hey your baby is frowning and trying to get away from you maybe he doesn't want to play right now but you it's the problem is i think we don't trust i don't trust the government with like simple tasks <laughs> it's, it's just it's amazing yeah, how, how about they fuck everything up um yeah yeah I, I, I mean, there uh, are there's what are supposed to be like my I, my mom went to think like mommy and me classes and that yeah. sort of thing where it's like it kind of teaches you like all the basics those are good things and honestly like I'm you know I'm pretty on the right and um, I'm not really for government involvement and things but if if we subsidize those sorts of classes yeah I'd be okay with that like I'm, I'm I don't I don't think that subsidizing daycare is a good idea at all no. but subsidizing classes for mothers to be better mothers yeah I have no problem with that at all yeah that'd be good something like that support the businesses mm-hmm. yeah it's Mm. we femininity i think has has really it's interesting feminism has has seemed to somehow disregard femininity in all of its different forms uh there so before we talked about this idea that uh polyamorous cultures or polygamous cultures have more violent men and so we've already seen like this this kind of proof that women tend to civilize men like femininity inherently is valuable in many ways um not that we really need proof of that but in the past we used to have these these societies where women were homemakers and i say this a lot but like women homemakers it didn't just mean you were like a slave and you were cooking and cleaning all day and you had nothing else to do you were out probably talking to the other women you were out watching your kids you were you were doing a lot of different things in the community you were probably making food for the old lady next door and in that way femininity had this place of bringing the community together of, of weaving it together and then when we have we have this very capitalist society and suddenly they were like oh we can make women work we can just get twice as much productivity out of people and suddenly 
femininity was worth less than the economy. And so we have this gradual, we've had this gradual shift towards women going to work and then really not prioritizing child rearing. And it, yeah, I, I don't, I don't exactly know the solution to that. Um, well, it's it's funny because when we started really encouraging to go for women to to be in the workforce, that was when we invented right after we invented a bunch of things to make women's job at home even easier. Mm -hmm. Right, I shouldn't say even easier because it was a very hard job, but um, like dishwashers, washing machines, like all these electric appliances mm -hmm. that would make things easier. And then okay, so now you can you have more hours to kind of spend. And it's like, okay, well, actually, now that we have that, now you can go into the workforce and you can make a couple extra dollars, right? Um, to what you were saying before, the way that it used to be was that men were in charge of the political sphere um, and kind of like the systems of, of how the country operated um, and uh, uh, building things, um, you know, like, like creating things outside of the home. And women were in charge of the social world and the family world. So like you said, like a woman's job was to be a master of the home and, you know, like there was all those 1950s cartoons where it's like, you know, the, the father comes home, he's tired. And then like the boy comes up and wants to complain about something. And the mother's like, don't, don't bother your father when he's smoking a cigar and reading the newspaper. Right. Because the idea was, it's like, you know, the father should only come in when there's like a huge dispute when it can't be resolved. The mother was in charge of what went around the household. And the mother was the one that coordinated had all the, 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 the social aspects of the community. And so women would talk within neighborhoods and that brings the community together women are, are are better at socially bonding and, and, and navigating these social uh, uh, environments in this way. I think men can make probably friends easier, but women create kind of different social bonds, I think, to build a community together um, even more so. And so um, it's, it's no wonder that, um, you know, a long time ago, people would know their neighbors, and now a lot of people don't know their neighbors or have to go out of their way or it's a weird thing. Um, I just bought a house recently, and I went and I uh, introduced myself to all the neighbors, and then I would, I would just, you know, talk to him like, oh, so what do you think about this guy right over here? It's like, oh, I never met him. You never met him. You've been living here for 15 years. You haven't yeah. met this guy. It's like, oh, I know his name. It's like, why haven't you said hi to him, right? It's like, if this guy's living near you, like, it, you know, I don't see anything wrong with him. And so, like, I, I, I'm, i you know, the one trying to, to, you know, meet these people because we've lost that sense of, of, of communal life. And what could be more important than your more most local uh, community? And maybe... With the advent of internet and, and, and cable and all that, people kind of just treat their home like it's their own safe world and never have to leave except when they go to work. But I don't think that's how most people want to live. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that when you have mother and father working all day long, who wants to go meet the neighbors afterwards? Mm. <laughs> right? But it's a lot easier when you have uh, homemakers who are meeting each other and, oh, the, the Johnsons are coming over for dinner later and, like, having that communal bonding between people, which resolves conflicts, right? It's, it's, it, you're not going to have a conflict if they're your neighbor, if you're friends with them, right? Like, oh, look at the, the fence line and is it over on, on my property, your property? That doesn't happen when you're friends with someone. You can resolve those things. You yeah. need to have women provide that social lubricant um, that, uh, that society needs um, um, through kind of that communal bonding. Yeah. We have these skyrocketing rates of depression too. And, I, and no wonder, I mean, we don't, we don't talk to people. Like we don't have these yeah. social interactions on a daily basis. One of the best ways to make friends is just to be in a location where at random intervals, you're going to see them a lot. So that's why school is so easy to make friends. Like you, you just see them regularly. And that's kind of what neighborhoods are. They're great for that, but we, we've, We've lost that, and especially in the pandemic. I mean, everyone's inside on Zoom. That's how that's our main form of communication now. We're getting more and more uh, introverted by by social measures. Yeah, and we're and we're teaching young children right now that it's uh, you know it's a bad thing to be around strangers and about people you don't know. Like you don't know the risk around them. I mean, I mean, strangers are a good thing for a reason, but not to be overly afraid of you know someone breathing near you, etc. Um, the damage we do to our children is maybe a, a whole other topic. Um, but uh, to what we were saying, I think that uh, certain areas are better than others. Like um, I'm from South Florida and Miami, and um, you'd walk by someone and people just avoided your gaze. Like they didn't want to talk to you if you're walking your dog. Like it wasn't like a even a hello situation. Mm. Um, but I moved to Chicago for a while. It's had that Midwestern friendliness. So even in a big city, I was living downtown. People still say hi to each other. Like, hi, yeah. look at each other. Hi, how's it going? Going to the elevator. Hi, how's it going? Yeah. 
make a little small talk, something like that. Um, so the culture is different, different places. Um, right now I'm on the West coast of Florida near Tampa and it's definitely friendly in South Florida, but you can, you can tell the difference with these things. Mm. Um, and I think most people would rather live in, in it's, you know, in an area where people smile at each other. I mean, it's not like a, sm a, a, a small thing, but smiling at people is very disarming and it makes you like a place a lot more. Yeah, and I, I think there's a change that we could be in the world as well. I mean, just smiling at the people around you is probably, I, I would, I think you'd be surprised. I think a lot of people would be surprised at how much it affects your day-to-day -day experience if you just walk around and smile at people, that's all. Yeah, and if you notice, especially if you're in a big city, or let's say I'm walking by someone, walking my dog, like in my past example, and I, let's say I want to smile at them, but they're like, they're like this all the time. Yeah. You know, they're looking at their phone. And they're, they're messaging. If you go on public transit, um, people are always on their phone, um, which, uh, you know, big cities is maybe to avoid like all the crazy homeless people. I was in Chicago recently mm -hmm. again, and you know, was, I, I wish I had, was staring with all the entire time. <laughs> I wasn't doing yeah. looking at nobody. Um, but that's a bad society to live in where you're so disconnected, where the people walk in, you're not even human beings. There's objects that go by you. You don't, you know, don't acknowledge them, don't acknowledge each other. That's not a community. That's something else. Dude, the homelessness in America. When I was there, I was I was shocked. Like Australia has the homeless people in Australia want to be homeless. Like literally, you have you have service workers who go over to them and they're like, Hey, do you want a house? And they're either too schizophrenic or like they don't, they literally just don't want to be outside. Like they just want to be outside. They don't want to, they don't want a house. Some of them own houses and then they just fucking live outside. So we have almost no homeless people. But in the States, they're everywhere. And especially yeah, I lived in Seattle, sort of it was crazy. Yeah. It, it was just unsafe. Like, and, and there's this extra level of, of uh, anxiety that I got because as I see this fucking guy talking to himself, walking down the street, like punching the air, I'm like, oh, he might, he could have a gun. He could also <laughs> own a firearm. I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. it was insane. A uh, 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 hundred percent. And I would say in America, it's the same sort of homeless people you get where some might have mental illness and some of the people are just like, nah, I just want to live outside. Um, and it's something that you grow, uh, grow um, a thick skin to when you live in the city. I lived in Chicago. I had homeless people come up. I had like, I had multiple guys with liquor bottles. Um, like, well, one guy that's trying to fight me, which I, I don't want to fight a homeless guy on the side of the street with people around me while he has a liquor bottle in his hands. <laughs> I've also and had a homeless person try to fight you, me. You can imagine. <laughs> um, other other situations like that. Um, and you just kind of grow a thick skin to it. And um, I, I lived outside of Chicago for a while. I've been in Florida. I went back to the business with some of friends recently. And I, I, I lost my thick skin. And I'll, I'm in the grocery store. And this guy's talking to himself. And like, all right, whatever. And then I hear something like, He's talking to himself, he goes, yo, hide that shit, the cops are here. I'm like, uh-oh, I don't know what he's hiding to himself, but I'm out of here, right? Like, I started I started getting real anxiety around people. I'm like, I'm like, is this guy looking at me? Like, why is this guy pacing back and forth right in front of me? Like, what do I even do here? You kind of lose that. And I I, I remember just, like, thanking God. Like, I'm glad I'd be out of this city. I forgot. I could use, you just go, like, a thick skin to how weird that is, and and you just get used to it. But it's not, yeah, it's not good when you, when you aren't used to it, for sure. I can't imagine a tourist feel these days going to all these big cities. Yeah, I, I feel like it has an impact, even if we don't realize it, even if it's like, oh, I grew a thick skin. For me, it felt like I was an extra level of anxious or stressed anytime I was in the city. Like, I am I guess I'm pretty hyper aware. I'm like always watching people in, in body language and stuff. But there would be times in the city when I would like, pause, like I would stop talking because somebody was freaking out. And I was just like, I had to watch them. And in certain situations, your your speaking brain turns off. You just can't talk anymore. And that would happen to me like frequently because there would just be like what I perceived as a threat coming down. Your and animal then, you brain know, turns on like fight, fight or flight. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it's like, oh, what, you know, so. Um, I but, think that like I'm, I'm, I'm six foot six. I'm like close to 300 pounds and I feel anxious in situations. We've created a society that that I was really telling women that they shouldn't be around. Because I can't imagine what it's like being a woman and, and walking around the daylight of Chicago, of certain areas, uh, much less at nighttime, riding a train. Like a lot of like women know, like I'm not gonna go late at night and ride a train with myself in a big city. Yeah. Like, and that shouldn't be a, a, a thing we're ever concerned about that. Because if you've ever been to, I was in I was in Seoul uh, in Korea uh, two years ago before the pandemic and completely clean, like no crime. Like people that weren't afraid of each other, right? And it's and like as a woman, like you know, you're obviously going to feel threats in a bigger way. Women are smaller; they're more vulnerable to crime. 
and um, we set up a society in which women feel uncomfortable even be around. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and right, it's not the cat calling; it's the homeless people yeah. that are really scary ones. <laughs> yeah, no, I cat. I mean, cat calling it's whatever, but I have a, like a, a a look, don't touch policy. Like as long as you're not trying, <laughs> as long as I don't, as long as you're not trying to like put your hands on me, it's fine. Yeah. Like I don't mind. Uh, that's not what I mean by cat calling is like the stereotypical like the construction worker over the fence is like yeah. whatever. It's different where you know you're on a subway train, you can't get away, and this guy gets in your face, and like yeah. you know that's a whole different thing, right? That, that, I'm not talking about that. That's yeah. terrifying. <laughs> that's a physical threat. That's like that's yeah, to me that's exactly. like the beginning of a physical threat. But yeah, it's um exactly. it's rough. It's so I, I think almost the situation in the states like. I feel like there's so many, I, I talked about this before uh, in another video, but I, I actually think if you study like cults, actually the US is, is has a bunch of predispositions towards being like, so one thing about cults is that they're, they're uh, it's not just like a, a religion, it's also the the same mindset and and kind of brainwashing techniques can be used for like, you know, Amway uses them and like, um, pimps will use them on on prostitutes and stuff like abusive relationships like they're all, it's all the same kind of techniques and so it's there's like your family has a lot of techniques yeah, yeah for sure like um lack of sleep is a huge one and mm -hmm. uh this thing like it's called love bombing like you're so you just love them so much and you're just all this good positive attention and then when they do the wrong thing it's just completely cut off and it's like yeah. ignored or um there's uh I mean, there's all sorts of like emotional manipulation, like changing the past, like you have some past actions. And then if you look at them, like if I look at my past, it's fine. But if I get brainwashed, it's like, oh, my dad abused me because he said this one thing one time, and he, all these different things. Yeah. So America actually, and I think the, the threat of violence, the constant undertones of violence, especially in major cities, I think are a huge contributing factor to like this more and more polarized society. Like, um, uh we we have but especially lack of sleep like americans they used to get i mean you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep or whatever now the average american is getting like six hours of sleep that's the average so a lot more americans or a lot of americans are getting like four hours of sleep five and i don't if you want to build a, a a good solid society five hours of sleep is not the right amount for it six hours of sleep yeah, I think we all know. I mean, we've had uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs for 150 years now. Um, but even when it comes to like the pandemic, um, it's the same sort of situation where it's like, instead of focusing on the things we know that humans benefit from, adequate sleep, um, proper nutrition, uh, exercise, that sort of thing, we focus on other things. Um, like, uh, not to bring it to coronavirus so much, but like, I've been wondering, like, we've been, it's been, the reason I'm actually bringing this up is that I have a friend of mine who this year he went on a weight loss journey. He was morbidly obese. He lost 120 pounds this year so far. He'll probably get to 150 by the end of this year because it's such a slow down after a bit. And, you know, one of the biggest risk factors for coronavirus is obesity. Yeah. Well, coronavirus has been around for, I mean, it's going to be almost two years uh, soon in December or November, depending on how you view it. And, you know, it would be really great if our, if our health officials told us, hey, start exercising and diet, right? Because yeah. we knew that was a risk factor for a while. We never say anything like that. You know, we, we focus on, hey, Big Pharma wants us to, to bring in these drugs and they're our masters. So don't look at the generic drugs, look at these. Don't look at, you know, like you you never hear that from public health officials to, to really watch what you eat and to exercise, which are yeah. some of those important things. Um, and, you know, uh, like addiction to fast food and, um, you know, I mean, I think that the, two of the biggest problems are addiction to food and addiction to sex in our society never really talked about. I mean, we talk about addiction to drugs, mm -hmm. um, but other other forms of addiction that are more common are, aren't discussed. Hmm. Interesting, addiction to sex. Yeah, it's, uh, I and once again, like, I, I believe the vaccine works. I don't think it doesn't work, but I also believe that there are definitely financial incentives strongly pointing towards us using the vaccine. And there are all these studies early on, and there's still studies now. I, I read one that was published like two days ago that show that vitamin D is, it just has a massive effect on coronavirus. And the vast majority of people, 90% of people are, are deficient in vitamin D. So like, 
most people, almost everyone has terrible vitamin D levels, even if you get sun, unless you're like a labor worker, like a construction worker, you probably have terrible vitamin D levels. And just going outside or like taking a vitamin D tablet every day is, is enough to bolster you. I mean, someone said it, it reduced your rate of mortality by itself by like 50%. So that's controlling for obesity, stuff like that. So if you lose weight, and reduce your vitamin D levels. So weight, uh, being obese Science is- you're not getting vitamin D from the sun. Yeah. Um, right. But even if, even if you don't want to get vitamin, even if you want to change nothing about your lifestyle, you can take a pill. It's not as good, but you can do it. And so, so like 50% reduction for vitamin D and then another 70% reduction for obesity, I think it was. I mean, that's pretty fucking good. That's a that's an excellent way to reduce the harm that coronavirus will do to you. And I have heard no governments at all talking about this at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I had coronavirus. Um, it was extremely mild for me because I'm, I'm young and healthy. Um, my wife did as well. Um, not really any symptoms. Both lost, lost her sense of smell, but that's not really feels like a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that um, to, to, to what you said, it's like that uh, the public health officials, they'll, they'll I'm not against the vaccine at all. Yeah. Like I just think it's a, it's a risk benefit sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The risks are a little bit unknown, not saying you could grow a third leg or anything like that. It's yeah. just that if there's no benefit to me, I don't have anybody as my ticket, but mm -hmm. I told my grandmother who's obese and has you know, past bronchitis and diabetes, you should definitely get it. I'm not going to visit you until you get it. Right. So mm -hmm. definitely not against it. Depends on the person, but yeah, you never hear them talk about there's the, um, I don't know what you're posting this. I don't know if you can take it off of YouTube, but there's all the prophylactic drugs like um, ivermectin and hydrochloroquine yeah. that provide some sort of benefit. But the problem is because of generics, there's like, oh, there's not good evidence, but these are, there's no, there's no uh, like uh, large scale studies on this. It's like, well, the reason why is because who's paying for the studies? If it's generic, <laughs> no drug companies doing it. Yeah. That's where the US government actually has a role to actually do these studies. Because you know, no private industry. Why would it, why would it, why would a private person ever do a large scale study, spend millions of dollars on studying if ivermectin is affected if they can't patent it? <laughs> They're not going to do it. And so, I'm not saying that the vaccines are bad. I'm just saying that we don't have as much evidence as we need for other treatments because we're not purposely the, the system is built to not get that evidence. Yeah, that's why generic drugs are never going to be recommended. That's why diet and exercise are never going to be recommended because who's going to do those studies? Yeah, no ivermectin is an interesting one. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's so it's a it's a generic drug. I believe uh, it has a lot of past. We know from past studies that it has a lot of. Um, it works against Zika virus, like a lot of different types of viruses, That's and it's safe. it's relatively harmless. It's relatively um, side effect free. Yeah. We you know nothing is, but it's pretty good. So there have been some studies in. There was a study in South America somewhere that showed like one hundred percent efficacy. It was just. 100% of people who took it prophylactically didn't get COVID. And now that's a little bit fishy to me, but I'm not sure. But then there was a study in Egypt that was completely wrong. Okay, right now, we have all these studies that are being published that are complete garbage because nobody's really checking them. And so right now we just have this influx of garbage and some good stuff and we don't know what's what. But the problem is the US government isn't doing any widespread studies of ivermectin. So we actually don't, now we're, we're looking at shit from Egypt and South America and we have no idea whether it's good. We 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 don't have a U.S. government approved study, and so they're saying there's no. We don't know if ivermectin is good. Well, you're not trying to prove whether it's good or not. You're just telling us that you're not sure. And well, doubly, it's like you're not trying to make to see if it's good, and you are censoring people and banning people from the internet. This is earlier on for even talking about it. Yeah, YouTube. YouTube is banning people for talking about ivermectin. Which yeah. We're, we're kind of and, 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 and it, and it, I don't know if you've seen the Dark Horse podcast. It's with Brett Weinstein yeah. and his wife. I forget her wife's name. Yeah. But they, they're both biologists. They were talking about it for a while. And they, they got, you know, strikes against them. And a clip removes. We're talking about it. Um, he's like, yeah, I just weighed the pros and cons with the literature. And, I mean, there's not really going to be any harm. So I'm going to start using this as a prophylactic. And got taken down because of it. Right. And it's like the now we have the arbiters, which is really a wing of the government now with these tech companies who are literally saying, like, no, we have to censor because go, the, if the government's, we follow what the government says. That's their, their argument now. It's like, oh, so you are a wing of the government if you are censoring based on what the CDC says or the government wing says, um, which is a problem. They weren't doing that when Trump was in office, though, were they? They weren't. <laughs> they 
they weren't censoring people. Uh, I don't know what for, what they would have censored them for, but like they weren't censoring people for Trump in the past. They weren't censoring people who were like uh, Trump's an idiot for saying the vaccine's going to come around. Oh, no. oh no, 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 no. Yeah, well, because like Kamala Harris said, it, a lot of people said, I don't want to trust this vaccine, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, last year it was Dr. Fauci was the one that was saying masks they're not going to be effective. Maybe get some droplets if you sneeze, but not in general. Surgeon General said so. Um, Kamala Harris, I don't trust the vaccine. A lot of the Democrats said that. Um, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a shift it's, again. That's the thing is like it makes us so we're not against the vaccine, but it but it makes us even go, ah, this is a little bit too much for me. Why are they pushing it down my throat and why are they censoring everything else? Yeah, um, I, I wonder if we'll if we'll kind of enter a new era of of perhaps different websites, alternates from YouTube. Like I, I use the Brave browser now instead of Google Chrome. And uh, I don't know if you know, do you know what the Brave browser is? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of cryptocurrency. So I'm like super into it, but like they pay you to watch ads and all the other ads are censored. And you also don't have to watch ads if you don't want to, but they just came out with a search engine and then they created, they created a VPN too. And they're suddenly, I feel like they're taking over the tech space and they're trying to encroach on Google and I'm using the Brave uh, search engine now I'm using I don't use the VPN but I'm using Brave all the time like as soon as another uh, an, another competitor presents a, a product that is just as good as Google's products I'm going straight to it like I don't and no. so I I wonder if the rest of society I mean Brave now has something like 12 million daily users it's just growing I, I think this, this, this for now, though, it took us to a certain size. Do you know what happened to Parler, right? Parler is an alternative to Facebook and Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. Parler is at one point the most downloaded app in the planet, more than wow. any other app. Yeah, so that's how big Parler got, and they took it down. Apple and Google said, no, we can't have it on our phones, which effectively eliminates it because there's only two really types of phones we have. They all worked together. They took down Parler, and Parler never came back from that, right? And that same thing that same happened with Gab. Um, Gab kind of had its own issues in the public before that point, but they also took Gab down, another social media alternative, because they know that if, it, if these alternatives come up, people will start to flock to them. And then the huge billion dollar companies and Facebook and Twitter, all these ones will start to lose market share. So they all work together to help each other out. And so Brave sounds great. Um, I use Dr. Go. I don't know if that's a browser, it's a search engine. I thought it was a browser search engine. as well. Okay, well, I guess I'm using Internet Explorer then. Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe he's brave. Yeah, I'm a boomer, I guess. I'm only 30. Um, <laughs> so, like, yeah, maybe it's good for now, but but then once brave gets big enough, I already know that they're going to come after it. I already know it. Um, these tech companies are not going to allow competitors to go. They're, they're running, they have extremely monopolistic practices, and they bought both sides, both parties, both political parties. And so they're not going to be investigated the way they should, and never going to be any antitrust action against them. So this is keep on taking over and either buying competitors or finding ways to ban their competitors. Yeah, we we do have some interesting issues. What do you think about like corporate monopolies? Because uh, anti, so anti-monopoly uh, legislation would, would essentially make it so really large companies like Amazon say had to be split up into multiple companies. I think that's that's kind of what the, I understand. The, the idea is that it's, it's not just necessarily that it's large, that it also has to have monopolistic practices, so so unfair practices. And so for example, so um, there's a there's a couple of YouTube, YouTube alternatives. One of the big ones gaining traction is, is, is Rumble. Rumble's a YouTube alternative. Hmm. And YouTube is banning um, certain like promotions of Rumble on its platform. Well, that is a, that's a, a anti uh, like but not anti uh, free market um, uh, practice because you're banning discussion of your competitor to be on on your platform. I, again, it's a private company, so it's a little bit harder than that. Whenever you act in a way like so, like Microsoft got in trouble back in the day because they um, had Windows ninety five of their computers and they would only sell computers, or they, they worked out deals with companies that, that they had to have Windows 95 installed. I forgot exactly what it was, mm -hmm. but we've done this in the past. We haven't had any big antitrust lawsuits um, recently. However, the European Union has been going after companies and, and tech companies and fining them for privacy concerns, and they're doing these antitrust things over there. How it would work with these tech companies? I don't know, because you hear a lot of people saying, like, um, when um, Standard Oil from uh, the, the Rockefeller fortune um, uh, the biggest oil company in the world, when they got split up, I think it was in the 1930s, they split up into like 12 different oil companies, right? But that's mm -hmm. not the work of Facebook. You can't split up Facebook into 12 different companies because if you were just going to flock to one of them, 
right? So doesn't really work. I mean, if I was a dictator, this is my second time saying it today, you can tell I really want to be a dictator. If I was a dictator, I would just ban social media. Just ban it. Ban also, a, even I YouTube? Think, I don't consider YouTube social media, yeah. um, but I'm talking about Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. I think those are all extremely negative things for society because it takes our our place, just like fast food. And I'm not saying we should ban fast food just yet. Um, right. No, I don't think we should ban fast food. But just like fast food plays in our uh, kind of like primitive desire for um, uh, meat and sugar and salt, um, social media uh, companies. Uh, play on our inherent desire for social acceptance and social conformity and when it comes to the public square which is, this has become it just starts to to completely get pockets of different ideas in society and then it completely um uh, separates people like the right and the left are getting farther and farther apart people are getting trapped into their own little bubbles of the whole, of the internet and ideas are becoming more extreme because you want that social acceptance um, not to mention that we're all addicted to our phones, um, not just our phones, but the apps, right? I'm sure, I mean, you're a better person than me if you haven't, but lots of people can, can recognize that feeling where you're doing something, all of a sudden you're on Facebook, like, how this happened? How am I on yeah. Facebook right now? How, I clicked on this on my phone, right? So we all recognize that feeling because they play on this inherent primitive weakness of ours. And there should be some sort of government regulation against companies doing this. Again, I know my, my joke before is that if you take my argument so far, you'd also ban fast food and stuff. So like, it's not like an absolute principle. It's more like we need to balance these things. To me, social media doesn't have any benefits um, it, um, uh, or any benefits that even come close to the negatives it has in society, mm -hmm. I should say. It has a lot of benefits if you're using it correctly. I mean, it, so it, I think if you're creating content, uh, it has a lot of benefits. It has tons of benefits because you're it's making great for money. businesses to, to advertise, right? Like yeah. you reach a lot of people. It targets interests extremely well, 100%. That's true. It yeah. does. And I mean, I'm trying to think because I use, I guess Reddit would be my main platform. And even, so it's not super social. Like you don't, I guess you talk to people, but you don't communicate directly but um like reddit is it's like candy like i just scroll through until i find that dopamine hit of of like an yeah. interesting fact or something and now that i you know when i when i really think back to it it's like the amount of time that i spent on reddit versus the amount of useful information i've gained is quite low i mean i, I could get a ton of information from a book i know what i'm getting uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's relevant to my life, but Reddit is somehow like a lottery, like a, a dopamine hit. What do you think about like, it's uh, kind of like so soccer versus basketball. It's like, if you want to celebrate every point in basketball, you're celebrating a lot, but in soccer, it's a big build up when he finds it, it's like, yeah, the score, or I found this piece of information. It's a huge hit. Then you go on to the next one. You're, you're searching for it. No, I understand. I think that there's a balance when it comes to that again, because Reddit isn't social media in the same way Facebook is. Um, and the, I think the biggest thing is that the, the feeds are a little bit different. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't maybe ever been on Reddit, maybe like, you know, like in terms of like having an account and all that, but like it, like, I don't know if Reddit targets your interest in a way and then, um, you know, puts people into different communities. I guess they do stuff. It does. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. it's just, maybe it's just as bad. No, I'm talking, no, I'm explaining myself. Um, <laughs> maybe, I mean, this is not news, maybe some subtle points, but, but I wasn't talking about all social media, but, but yeah, definitely a lot of it is as inherently negative. At least Reddit is supposed to be able to information. No, it's, 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 uh, again, it's kind of what you make it. Like I've kind of gone through my social media feed and been like, okay, so I want positive shit. Like I want useful yeah. stuff. One of my favorite subreddits that's, uh, a little bit controversial, but whatever it's, uh, I mean, it's not really, it's called red pill women. And it's like mm -hmm. strategies for getting married. And then it's, it's, it's an awesome, it's, it's just a great subreddit. It's like, um, yeah, and how like a good to, thing. yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it's also like how to be a good wife to your husband. And like, you know, it's, it's just, I've, I've had so many really useful pieces of advice and tips from that. And that's kind of, I think probably one of my most frequented subreddits, but it, it's and, like, and um, the, go on. No, sorry, you can continue. Oh Yeah. It's like, uh, I mean, some of the best, some of the best uh, advice there is for marriage, for instance, is just like, hey, if you're a woman, um, if this is something I don't see women necessarily doing as much as I think they should, but it's like, uh, you better like tone down on what you're asking for in a man. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. for instance, 
for me, like intelligence is huge. And so it's like, okay, so if I want intel, you know, I'm already with a person, it's amazing. But when I was looking, it was like, okay, so I want intelligence. And so I need to forfeit, like, if he's bald, I, I can't, I can't make that a selection criteria. If he's not six foot, I can't make that a selection criteria. Like if he doesn't have exactly the job I would like him to have, you know, I can't, I need to forfeit that because uh, values are so important. And it, like, it, it really made me prioritize values. And even just the way they talk is, um, they, they talk about the man as the, the captain of the relationship. And then the woman is the, like the first mate. And so the first mate is super important, super valuable, but she's not the leader. She's not the one who's like executing on the, the, um, she's not telling everyone what to do and like kind of controlling the environment, but she's bringing new information. She's keeping the ship clean. I don't know. She's doing a bunch of really important stuff and you need both. Um, but yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I think, yeah, go on. I, I think that the um, the issue that a lot of women are finding is that it's like, I think that all women naturally desire a leader and desire a man who can provide them with security and comfort. The issue is, is that we're creating a society of men who aren't ready to fill that role. And so like, if you're a woman, like, okay, well, I'm, I'm ready to be um, submissive in the relationship for the right leader, mm -hmm. right? Someone who could make me feel comfortable being the best mate or well, the first mate, whatever the term was, but they're not necessarily fine now in society. Or it's, or, it's, or it's hard to know if you're finding that leader because you really can't just trust anybody to be the captain of the ship. And that ends up being the hard part. Um, I think that's what we were saying before. Well, like, you know, Tony, now what you're looking for is that if you're if you're dating, um, and again, since women date up and you find, okay, I dated that guy, extremely successful. Dated that guy, extremely attractive. Dated that guy, extremely funny, right? And then when you're dating someone new, you're comparing them, of course, because because we're all humans. We compare it to people we've dated in the past. And you go, oh, he's not as smart as that one, though. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know if he's going to be right for me. He's not as attractive as this. Well, again, you're not going to find everything all in one, right? But after dating for a while, you start to kind of feel that way, where it's like, you know, you're, you're comparing past relationships. And the more you date, the more you start to compare, like looking for something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so true. I think... Um... I think you're right in that a lot of men aren't taking on leadership roles, but I, I think um, as a woman, you have the ability to at least help him take on a leadership role in a bunch of ways. Like, for instance, just letting him decide on different shit. Like one one is um, in the there's this book called The Surrendered Wife, which is kind of the red pill women. Like it's it's one of the books that they always recommend, and um, in she says like if your husband's driving don't tell him where like what route to take if he knows where he's going don't like try to control his shit all the time you know if if he's definitely taking a wrong turn and he's going the wrong way like maybe let him know right let him know like give him the information if he doesn't have the information but if he already has the information let him do what he's doing it's it's just in so women many ways have a, yeah women have not learned the example from their mothers who maybe never knew the example of how to talk to men so the classic example i give is that woman if you're if you're cold you don't tell your husband can you make the thermostat lower you say i'm cold yeah right because you say i'm cold oh, it's chilly in here then the husband's was like oh i can go and satisfy her i can go do this and then they go do this and then he feels good by himself if you tell a man to go do that he's not gonna feel good by himself men don't like being told what to do yeah. right and so if you suggest things in a way men do naturally i mean a good man maybe maybe some girls out there don't have this in their partner but yeah. a good man wants to satisfy their partner and so if you provide them with things that would satisfy you in a way that's not telling them then they will try to satisfy it yeah and so that's really important learning how to communicate in that way for sure yeah um there's this really wonderful quality in in i think most men that is that they want to be a provider and they want to give as like they want to provide for women that's why i think that's why only fans works because <laughs> there are all these oh, men yeah, who are like i i this is to give women money and <laughs> they just do it i don't know i can't uh, explain any other reason but um that's it a, i've the, never i've never understood why that that is that 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 works the only fans how to have a consumer base but i think that's the best explanation i heard actually is that I mean, they have nothing else to kind of provide so they want to find someone to care for and you get this whole entire and i'm sure the girls are only fans know how to play it up and then um you know they feel like oh i'm the support system right because men naturally have that desire to support a woman yeah they, i knew this girl who um 
who would like go on Tinder without even meeting the guys and she would get them to send her Uber Eats deliveries. Like just for, she got free meals without even having to go on dates. It was just- Must be nice to be a pretty girl. Yeah, she wasn't even pretty. She wasn't even- oh. <laughs> Must be nice to be a girl. Yeah, to be a girl. Like, she was not great looking. Uh, just psychopathic too. Like, but anyway, um, as as you would be. Um, but there is this interesting thing where, like, the woman we we have been told all all our lives that we have no power in a relationship, but we have so much power. Like, you control the dynamics. So if you're more feminine, if you allow him to be a leader, he will naturally rise to that role. And and like. If you tell him there, there was one that I, you know, that it seems to work. It's like, if you say that you want something, right? There's this interesting thing where you're telling him your emotions and then you're leaving it to him. And so if you say like, I want to, I would like to get pizza tonight and you let him decide whether you get pizza or not. If he decides, no, you don't like throw a fit because you're not controlling him. You're not telling the captain what to do, but you're allowing him to fulfill that need in you. And then he gets to feel like he provided. And then you oftentimes get more than you would have gotten before. And you're not like telling him, hey, we need to get like, we're getting pizza tonight. I've decided we're, you know, and so. Yeah, it has to be subtle. It has to be more like, oh, I'm really craving pizza, yeah. right? Yeah. Women have the ability, women in general communicate with each other in more subtle ways than men communicate with each other. Women are better at communicating subtly. And so that's why like female bullying and male bullying is so different, right? Like a lot of times female bullying will be something men can't even see, right? Men don't even know what's happening. And then like, I've, you know, talked to women before, it's like, oh, can you believe that? I'm like, what? It's like, you hear how she said that? I'm like, no, I didn't hear anything. What, what's happening? And all the other girls like, oh, I heard that. It's like, oh, you know, I didn't notice. Because women have more subtle ways of communicating and men are originally more direct. And so women could do things in a subtle way. Again, I can't teach it to women, but I'm sure that's the mother's role is to teach them earlier on, right? Or at least to learn it from their friends or pick up examples of how to keep, how to do things in a, in a subtle way to number one. I mean, one thing that's important for, for, for men is men's egos. So boosting a man's ego is, is really important, especially if he wants to be a leader, right? Mm -hmm. Like a man, if he's confident enough, will try to be a leader. But if you put him down, then he's not going to be the leader because he's not going to be confident, yeah. right? And so, I mean, it's obviously a balance. So you don't want your husband to think he's hot shit and, you know, deserves multiple wives and stuff like that or to be better than you but you know but but boosting his ego is a good thing in order to have a, a healthy marriage i think oh that's such a good point let me ask what made you decide that your wife was the one um i think that when uh i met my wife that was five years ago I had been dating a lot of women and uh it was i was um it was before i went to northwestern law school and I was about to practice for a big firm doing mergers and acquisitions. And that summer in between my law school in Chicago and where I work also in Chicago, I went down to South Florida where I'm from since I'm a family. So when I was there, I wasn't thinking I'm going to meet my future wife. I was just dating around. Right. Um, but, um, I met, I met my wife and, you know, sparse, sparse flu, but it, it wasn't necessarily like, you know, uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be like, oh, this is the person I'm going to marry all that. I was like, oh, I really like this girl. This girl's cool. And as our relationship progressed, I, I realized there's all these kind of personal qualities I liked in her. She was kind of like kind of opposite of me. Um, and and person I think that opposite personalities um, match, but it's like you, you just have similar interests, opposite personalities is, is what mm -hmm. I believe. Because if you don't have similar interests, you're not going to be able to, to do a lot of things together. Um, but I remember she 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 cooked me a, a, a big meal without me asking, and it was delicious. And what they what your what your mother say is like the, the, what's it the way to a man's heart is through stomach right mm -hmm. it's like cl classic wisdom right so i you know i didn't ask her i was like oh it's really nice right and i started seeing all these other qualities in her and then so even at the time i wasn't looking right and i've been dating a lot of girls and no one else kind of like did the sort of things that she did that was in a, in a very feminine way obviously she's attractive she's also extremely intelligent she's an eye doctor there's a million different things right um but I, I saw these things and I wanted to pursue it past that, right? And then as um, the relationship progressed, right, the reason why I ended up wanting to marry her is I could see her being that person in my future. One of the most attractive things to, to most men attracted to me is um, is a woman who looks like, who who you know would be good with children. That's an extremely attractive quality. The most unattractive thing I could, I could hear is a woman going, ugh, I don't know if I want kids. That's like the, most, the biggest turnoff ever. Um, but a woman who's excited to be a mother, who um, who is excited to do things that you can imagine your future life being? You're 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 rationally going to start to respond to that.
right? Not even on an irrational level. Uh, the irrational level is when you're, you know, again, your first sexual partner, that sort of thing, which could be important in some ways. But the rational level is like, oh, I could actually create a life with this person, right? And so I'm like, well, I have this connection with her. She's smart. She fills a lot of things on paper. Or, you know, you don't have to have all the things. You fill up a lot of things on paper. And I can see myself um, uh, creating a future life. And at the time, you know, I was, I was, I'm 30 now, I was 25. My plan, my master plan was I'm not going to be um, married till I'm 30. Or I'm not going to even try until I'm 30, right? I want to be young and successful and then deal with that. But, you know, things happen. <laughs> yeah. And so even though I wasn't looking for it, it happened anyway, which is probably the case with many people. Yeah. And so they're looking for it. It comes in your lap. Hmm. That's interesting. I think um, that definitely shows that I think oftentimes women don't realize that what they look for in a man is not what men look for in a woman um, in many ways. I, I don't think success is as big of a deal <laughs> almost almost at all. I mean, I think a lot of guys want a woman who they can like have good conversations with and an intelligent man might want an intelligent woman to keep up with him. But I think uh, success is is a lot less of a big deal. And hmm? I think this goes back to what we said beforehand. This is what I want to bring up, but it, it slipped my mind. Because you would say like smarter women is like, you know, have like a smaller playing field or, you know, the, sorry, field to choose from. The thing is this is that a lot of the smart women you're talking about, like, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a PhD, I'm all this, right? They think, oh, well, it's nice to find a man who has more than that. The thing is the men aren't necessarily looking for doctors and PhDs. It's not the super attractive quality. Right. My, my wife is now an eye doctor. I met her. She would, was about to enter optometry school, but that wasn't the thing that attracted me to her. I can care less. Mm. Um, honestly, I, I could have cared less. And, and, but the fact that I was about to be, start work as a prominent lawyer was, of course, very attractive to her because men and women look for different things. Mm. And so if you're a woman thinking that your career is something that should attract a man, you have to understand men that are so what men are actually looking for. Not saying that, uh, uh, you know, like a lot of men don't want to, it depends, you know, the, different preferences a lot of men don't want to be with someone who's a stay-at-home mom because they can't support a stay-at-home mom mm. a lot of men want someone who's rich because they don't have the money right and so you know you should understand that like oh if man likes your career that much then maybe it's a bad thing <laughs> maybe he's actually because more of like a kind of using your sort of relationship it's like oh she could provide for me you don't want a man who thinks that you could provide for him yeah not a good thing no, not at all. It's uh, it, it kind of comes back to evolution. I always, I always try to trace things back to evolution. Like, in a hunter-gatherer type society, you would be taking care of a, a child all the time, or or near all the time. And so, a man is not going to be attracted to a woman who can go out and hunt a boar because he needs a he can do that himself. Hopefully, uh, he's attracted to a woman who can take care of a child and and like deal with domestic duties and relate to people well and and help him you know achieve good status in a society like he's he's attracted to a number of more um i guess personality type of things uh, and also visual looks cues. yeah uh, for sure visual cues i mean obviously visual cues you want someone who's young who can you want someone who can bear you 10 babies rather than someone who can bear you one baby like someone you know. who's not going to die in childbirth right which is also yeah. visual cue like yeah. wider hips that sort of thing mm. yeah why is this for a reason that? right someone who, who could feed your young mm. yeah yeah who could feed you <laughs> yeah yeah mm. who can feed you <laughs> yeah for, yeah for, it's a big yeah big deal um it's interesting i wonder what facial feature like faces faces are so important but i have no idea why i i don't know why yeah. that would play into like health I wonder about that line. The only thing I can really think of is, well, facial symmetry apparently is a good indicator of other genes. Mm. But facial symmetry is, is probably important in a transplant. I don't really exactly know. I'm sure it is. Mm. Um, but uh, in terms of other traits, it's, it's kind of hard to say. Like, um, uh, you know, like uh, like like blue eyes didn't exist. Uh, blue organ eyes um, didn't exist until like 10,000 years ago. And then once it came onto the scene through mutation, it spread like wildfire because everyone wanted to have those babies mm. <laughs> 10,000 years ago. And so it spread from there, but blue green eyes don't show any sort of advantage, mm. right? So some things are kind of just random like that of, of what we find attractive. Some yeah. things are culturally influenced. That is that is true. Some things are culturally influenced, but I mean, mostly genetic, um, but some things are random. They don't have to have, to have an evolutionary backing for it, I don't think. Oh, yeah. But if or you maybe had... it's one we haven't discovered. 
if everyone had brown eyes and you saw someone blue eyes, you'd be like, oh, they're a god. Like they they have been touched by the gods. And then you would just yeah. you know, want to have kids with them. That, that what, if you, what if you saw some what if you saw someone red eyes though? <laughs> yeah. Oh. I don't know. I don't know if that'd be attractive. <laughs> well, I'm living in today's society. I don't know about 10,000 years ago, maybe you would be, but it's kind of like a bad look. I don't know. It could be a random occurrence that blue or green ends up being something that's attractive to a lot of people, whereas red might not be attractive. Or maybe it is, I don't know. It's kind of hard to imagine yeah i don't know i don't know if anyone with red eyes has ever existed that would be interesting like the color of fire people might think they're the devil and just kill them yeah <laughs> <laughs> probably been some some shit like that that's happened there's probably been some yeah. like evolutionarily like adaptations like i don't know people with six fingers or something and we've just been like no they're they're not good yeah. we, we extra pinky get... don't like that yeah yeah, yeah. um mm. So what's uh what's on the agenda next for you in uh in your your social media career? Do you think? So um, right now, you know, I um I, I bought a house recently, and uh, we've been spending so much effort uh, uh fixing up the house. And once that's done, gonna get back to start making YouTube videos. Um, and probably more man the street stuff. Um, anyone listening, uh, big bad bears you on Instagram on YouTube. I did a couple of cool um man the street interviews back when I was in Chicago. Um, slut walk and Chicago gun violence, all those different things. Um, it's, it's a fun thing to do interviewing people on the fly. Um, you know, some people are, you know, we used to see those mandatory interviews in which people are, are like idiots and they get made fun of. But a lot of times I went and I uh, got an intelligent conversation and been able to dis discuss things, not necessarily on my political aisle, um, but on other aisles and be able to kind of debate issues in a, in a, in a minor aspect. Of mm -hmm. course, you also have idiots coming up to the camera. And that's, that's also fun too, to for the entertainment aspect of things. That's yeah, there's, um, yeah, when things settle down, I'll be doing a lot more of that stuff. It's interesting. I did I did one of those. I, I haven't published that. I don't know if I will, but there was so much rejection involved, actually, I noticed. Like I would get, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like a political rally, so maybe that's different, but I was just on the street talking to people and like really like one out of three people would say yes. And then the other the other ones would yeah. And so um it was yeah i don't know if it's like an australian thing or maybe i just wasn't charismatic enough but it was uh a, a lot of people are shy to be on camera mm. yeah for sure and yeah. you're like pointing a camera in their face and stuff so they they don't like it but i actually when, yeah, when, when was, i go to the slut walk and i and i, and I see a, a girl in a thong and like wearing nothing i think the girl's okay with attention right yeah. so she's like oh <laughs> camera right another type of crowd where it's like excuse me expect respect my privacy <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit different <laughs> male attention wow yeah yeah that's uh that's kind of a given for sure all right uh i think i'll i think i'll end it there thank you so much for coming on it was great until next time thanks for yeah, having me yeah this is awesome see you later bye